we're super thankful for Nathan Ward coming out tonight to give us our first lecture. Uh, Nathan Ward has been in the Biblical Studies Department at Forest Lodge since 2008, and he's been teaching full-time since 2011. The same year, he began work as a preacher and teacher at the Big Community School Congregation in Tampa. His graduate work at various schools focused on biblical studies, Christian apologetics, and theological interpretation of biblical texts. His last book, uh, Birth in the SB Library, from 1999, and also teaches as an adjunct professor of health sciences. And his son, Shia, and Gina, serve at Sienna Forest Lodge Academy at John Ray Mission. Uh, so tonight, he's going to be talking to us about the purpose of suffering smacks you in the face, it doesn't work quite so well anymore, and you need to think about it from a different angle. So the more different perspectives you've thought about this from, the better equipped you are for dealing with it. And it doesn't matter how well equipped you are for dealing with it. When it comes, it comes, and it's not easy. The great American philosopher, Mike Tyson, <laughs> once said something to the effect of, everyone has a plan. So what I want to do is share with you, as we think of the purpose of suffering, a variety of different perspectives on that. Probably somebody could take the basic uh, outline that I'm going to go through today and preach at least five different lessons out of it, because there's so much deeply embedded in all of the ideas that we're just going to scratch the surface of, and hopefully you'll find that to be a helpful way of, of thinking about this from different perspectives. First, I want to lay a little bit of groundwork as we think about suffering itself. First of all, and I think this is uh, obvious and everybody knows this, there's nobody in the room that this is new to, but I think it's something we need to remind ourselves of continually as we think of this, is that suffering is always, at least generally speaking, a result of sin. We 
must remember that God created a perfect universe with no pain and no sorrow and no sickness and no death. And humankind corrupted that with sin, and that brought pain and sorrow and sickness and death. And while we may all be very, very happy throwing that blame at the feet of Adam and Eve, we are all more than So we have certainly continued the pattern of sin that has brought this sort of suffering in the world. The second thing that I'd say is something we don't like to think about, and that is, as a result of this, we all deserve suffering. What we like to believe is that the bad things that happen to us happen to us when they shouldn't. Some of what we need to have in our mind as a baseline perspective, as a foundation to build everything else on. And so as we begin to think of the purpose of suffering itself, I want to think about this in terms of different types of suffering. And as we think about different types of suffering, we can see different purposes that suffering brings at different times. I'm going to be honest, I'm borrowing some of this
probably of two very quick examples of why this is not the case sometimes, right? The book of Job is exactly about this not being the case. Job is suffering, and his friends show up, and his friends spend a really good week with him where they sit there and they keep their mouths shut. But eventually they just can't contain themselves, and they start talking, and they start advising, and ultimately they start accusing. And the entire point of the friends' speeches over and over and over again is, Job, you must have done something wrong to bring this upon yourself. Job, if you just repent, God will restore you. You know, some of the best you know, five-minute invitation talks that you find anywhere in the Bible are on the lips of Job's friends. Just come back to God, and Job, and he'll restore you by the standard of sin, you almost expect him to say at the end of some of those. I mean, they are fantastic. By the end, one of his friends proceeds to give a list. Job, you sinned this way. Job, you sinned this way. Job, you sinned this way. And quantifies exactly how Job has sinned. And of course, if you're reading the book of Job, you know good and well he's not done any of those things. He is a righteous man who fears God and turns away from evil. That's how God described him. There is none like him on the earth, God says of him. And in fact, God says to Eliphaz, go to quit in the end of the book, he has not spoken rightly in you as my servant in this book. Well, you might think of the man who was born blind in John chapter 9, when they come upon him and the disciples of Jesus look at Jesus and say, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, if I may paraphrase, no, 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 that's not what's going on here at all. That's not what this is about. That's not the reason that he is blind. It has nothing to do with anybody's sin, specifically in this case. <clears throat> and so we're quick to push back against this as a type of suffering, but it is undeniable that some suffering is for this very purpose. Just ask Nadab and Abihu. Just ask Uzzah. Just ask Ananias and Sapphira. Just ask a random bank robber who walks into a bank and gets gut shot and lays on the floor bleeding out. Ask the promiscuous person who brings all sort of suffering in their life, whether it be physical or emotional or psychological, because of serial promiscuity. Jesus tells the lame man in John chapter 5, stop worse happening. His sin could lead to more suffering. This is a type of suffering, and it has a very clear purpose. Sometimes, not always, sometimes God punishes people because of their sin. And sometimes suffering is just a natural consequence of the stupidity that sin is. You make a dumb choice, you wind up in a dumb place. <laughs> about from a biblical perspective is suffering that has a purifying purpose. And you can think about this in the context of a variety of different biblical passages. In Hebrews chapter 12, the author of Hebrews says this, beginning in verse 3, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation? Son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one that he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which we have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline proves painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see, this was a different thing than Ananias and Sapphira endured. God was directly involved, and they 
suffered because of their sin, but that was punishment. This is discipline. This is something that is very different. This is to correct the person who receives it. And that doesn't mean it's pleasant when you endure it. Peter says, in this salvation you rejoice, though now for a little while it's necessary you've been grieved by various trials, so that you're tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just as gold is purified by being put to the fire, so also our faith, as its impurities burn away, as we are tested in the suffering and the trials that we face in life. James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, the trials and the testing produces this good thing that comes as a result. Paul experiences this personally and directly in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, but it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You might remember what Jesus said to the crowds around him back in Luke chapter 13. When they came to him and asked him about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed. He said, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed him, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And the suffering that they witnessed, not their own this time, but the suffering that they witnessed was to teach this lesson of purification. And you might think of Hebrews 5, and that might be the most surprising example of this. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. To quantify all of that just a little bit, what we see in all of this is suffering as discipline in conflict. That's why I started with that text in Hebrews 12. Suffering as discipline. Sometimes it's positive discipline, sometimes it's negative discipline. It's suffering that brings repentance. It's suffering that gives warning to the innocent. It's suffering that teaches humility and obedience and dependence. That's what suffering does in our lives if we're looking at it with open ears to hear what God is saying. C.S. Lewis makes this point very well in the shortest way that only C.S. Lewis can. In Apollo of Cain, he says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You ever had that experience? Something horrible and unexpected happens in your life and you are closest to God when you have been the most. Suffering does that. And C.S. Lewis goes on to talk about this. Sometimes it drives people away. Sometimes it brings them closer. Sometimes it burns with that fire that Peter talks about. But there's no real faith there to purify in the first place. And so all will draw off to him for that reason. And when there is faith there, it brings that person to their knees in prayer. Suffering is rewarding. And it shows us so. But what if suffering didn't have this sort of function? Think about this in practical, everyday examples rather than the spiritual realm for just a second. What value is there in physical pain? Nobody likes physical pain, right? What, what happened if all the nerve endings on your hand stopped working and you put your hand on top of a hot stove and didn't realize it? And you stood there like that talking to your mom in the kitchen for 45 minutes with your hand on a red hot burner. Don't you wish you felt a little bit of pain at that point? Well, your hand is basically gone at that point, isn't it? 
shoulder of pain, he sprained his ankle. So he just kept running and jumping on it like nothing was wrong. That's how you wind up losing a foot in the ankle. There's very much a sense in which pain is a blessing because it provides the warnings that we need to protect us from worse harm. And there's every reason to suspect that there's a spiritual corollary, especially when we see so many passages that portray this sort of thing. Suffering provides the warnings that we need to keep us from worse harm. <coughs> Sometimes, however, it's a little bit harder to pin it down. I'm going to call this suffering for an unknown good. Now, sometimes it's really easy to look at what's going on in your life and to say, you know what? <laughs> I've been an idiot for the last six months. I think God has just smacked me upside the head really good and I think I'm out of it. Sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's really easy to see it in retrospect. You don't know it right now, but you look back on it at a later time and you say, oh, I see now, I understand now. This is how I grew. This is how other people were impacted positively. This is how, you know, fill in the blank. about people who suffered and who grew greatly in their suffering. And he, he talks to a variety of these people who've gone through this sort of thing, and he asks them, he says, would you give up the growth that you have experienced if it meant you never had to suffer? And every single one of them said, no, I would not. I would rather suffer and grow than not suffer and not be who I am today. I don't know if you've experienced that in your life at the reality is that most of us who suffer, when we look back on it from a later perspective, we usually see that it was a tiny bit of old junk. Whether it is growth in us or growth in our friends or an opportunity to teach the gospel to somebody. My wife's cousin, several years ago now, lost her baby to SIDS. And she and her husband in their morning were talking to a man. Suddenly, gave this clue to look through the gospel, and he wasn't her friend. And her husband said one of the most remarkable things that I've ever heard any Christian say in my life. And it shook this man to the core, and he was an elder in the church for a number of years. The man said to this man, Joel, if my son's death brings you joy, fathom what a statement that is in primitive times. And even right now, I think you have some idea of what that kind of statement would look like. But here's the thing. We don't always know that. We can't always see that. We don't always see the person with bad pain. And so Keller goes on to say, with kind of perspective, most of us can see good reasons for at least some of the tragedy and pain that occurs in life. Why couldn't it be possible that from God's vantage point, there are good reasons for all of this? You know, sometimes we can't figure it out because we're too short-sighted. Sometimes we can't figure it out because we're too flesh-oriented in our minds. Sometimes we can't figure it out because we're just not good enough for ourselves. But how can I possibly imagine that God can't see far more good than I could ever come up with on this side of Joseph catches a glimpse of this in his own life. In Genesis chapter 25, when he and his brothers have been reunited and they're terrified at knowing that this is Joseph, he says, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. You sold me, but God sent me. He had come to realize from his later perspective what was going on. Later, after Jacob dies, they're again afraid, thinking that jo Joseph is going to take out his vengeance. And Joseph again says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about so that many people could be kept alive as they are today. So sometimes we can see it. Sometimes we can't. The College of Engineering Crete tells the story of a bear caught in a trap that a hunter stumbles across and wants to help. 
takes out a tranquilizer gun and shoots the mayor in order to help him. But from the mayor's perspective, it just seems like he shot him. He goes to the mayor to release him from the trap. The only way to release the bear trap is to squeeze its tires and to let the cat go. If you're not hearing the demonstrable proof that he is a very successful man in hiding him, he squeezes the trap and he's hiding the blood in the cage. From the mayor's perspective, everything that this man does is for evil. From the hunter's perspective, everything that he does is for good. Why is this bear trap so important? We'll start with these words. Because it understands. Man has your guess that the difference between you and God is far greater than the difference between that bear and you. If we can understand why the bear trap did it, then surely we can understand why we sometimes don't do it. Look at the book of Job. Job has never explained to you. God never explains to some good that I can't possibly foresee might come out of any suffering that I endure or any suffering that you endure. Whether it's my immediate life, the life of my children, the life of my students, or the lives of people I'm in the room with. We just don't know the answer to those questions. But God does. And one of the great messages of the book of Job is God telling Job the message that Job trust me. Suffered because of the wicked. 
could feel compelled to put on a happy face for God, then that's not how we do it. Honesty requires us to be transparent with God and with one another. And God has shown us over and over and over again, in one inspired prayer after another, that he is okay with us being honest. And God has shown us time and time again that he's not okay with us lying. Tell God how suffer, go to God in your lamentation. That's what he needs to do. And then finally, I've had to think about and contrast the value of lament with the great unimportance of emptiness. That's what we want from this, right, Mike? One of these days I'll understand it. In fact, we have an old song, even if you don't sing that much anymore, that says that very thing. Farther along, say that the present suffering is not worth comparing to the answers we will receive. The present suffering isn't worth being compared to the glory that will be revealed. Let me conclude with a little story from my father's life. Some of you know him because they moved down to the area uh, this past summer. My father grew up in northwest Arkansas in one of the poorest parts of the country at that point. And his family was a poor family. not have running water in it, as if you and I know. He was born not in a hospital, but in his house. When they had a special occasion of some kind or another, my grandfather, his dad, would take the family down to the corner store where he would buy all of them a great new house, which is something that doesn't exist anymore. A sweet great Fanta in a glass bottle. kids do, he tripped, the box went flying, the lid popped off, and it landed right on the bench and fell asleep in the furnace, and down they all went. It didn't go into the furnace and burn up, but they were down there, inaccessible to him, and he was inconsolable. He cried and cried and cried, until eventually my grandfather took the whole thing apart and wrote a new piece. Well, there's two things about that that you should know. The first is that from his perspective in his life, it was just a silly little story that gets his dad bent out of shape about a collection of bottle caps. Sure, they're sentimental, but they're bottle caps. He's inconsolable. I can't help it. The second thing you need to know about that is the only reason he even knows that story is because he heard his parents tell it so many times. You've got stories like that in your life, right? You don't remember it, but you know it backward and forward because your parents love to tell it. And so this one thing in his life that he once thought was so terribly traumatic, first, he thinks it's silly now, <coughs> second, he doesn't even remember it. I think about that story when I think about the sufferings that we endure and the promise it calls and the confidence in it. Answers might be nice, but what's far greater than that is to realize that in the presence of God, the greatest suffering that we have ever endured in this life is nothing but a collection of bottle caps. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then we're going to be dismissed for a couple minutes before we start the next one. Let's pray. God, we praise you and thank you so much for today. We thank you for 
tonight in this moment that we get to learn more about you and your character. And when we think about suffering, we think about your son. God, thank you so much for sending him uh, to this world to endure suffering for us. Please um, keep our hearts focused and grounded in you, even though we don't know all the answers all the time. And as we've discussed, we don't, we don't always need to know the answers. God, help us to trust in you and to learn more about you and your character so that we can trust in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
squad. There's like <laughs> loud music and stuff, and it's going to be pretty distracting. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to McCarty. That way we'll actually be able to... Uh, 